All right, in this session we're going to be looking at some common brain tumors, uh, but first I thought we would look at some relatively normal brain. Uh, here you can see, and this is, I say relatively normal because we're actually adjacent to some brain tumors, so uh, slightly cellular. However, this is a good opportunity to look at what normal brain would look more like, and you can see that it is rather sparsely cellular. Um, you see a little bit of pigment scattered around as well as uh, some macrophages uh, and microglia, which are these uh, little dots. That's kind of the inflammatory component within the brain. You see uh, all the uh, fibrillary processes coming off of the neuronal cells, and so uh, that's normal. Those are basically axons that you can see traveling through there. And that's just a really short breakdown of normal brain, but as we head towards the tumor, you're going to see the cellularity increase dramatically, right? So as we head into these areas, what we're looking at in this case is actually one of the most common types of tumor. Uh, this is a astrocytoma. This would be WHO grade 4, unfortunately, for this patient, meaning that this is a glioblastoma multiforme. Some of the things that we use to tell if a tumor is a glioblastoma multiforme is the uh, increase in nuclear density as well as uh, mitotic activity. Uh, and these structures that we can see from low power, and this is what we would call palisading of the cells or nuclear palisading. And if we go down and we take a closer look, the reason it looks like that is because the nuclei are lining up. Uh, and that's the term we use uh, when we say something is palisading. In addition, Glioblastoma multiforme is often a tumor that is associated with necrosis, and here you can actually see a little pocket of coagulative type necrosis within this tumor. Uh, so you see these nuclei, uh, they're still present, you can still make out the cell borders, uh, but everything's pink and washed out. Uh, in this tumor, actually up here, we have large areas of necrosis where you can still kind of make out some structures, uh, but everything is dead in these areas. So that is a glioblastoma multiforme. Here is another very common tumor uh, that we see. And so this tumor is very pink at low power, uh, which is a fi uh, defining feature of one of these. Uh, in addition, when we go down and take a look a little bit closer, we can see some calcifications. And so this is one of the two tumors that is associated with calcifications. Uh, this would be a meningioma. And so classically, when we talk about meningiomas, uh, we talk about the swirling and the nested pattern that you can see in this. And so if you look at the groups of cells, you'll notice that they're kind of rounded up. And that is what we call nesting. Uh, and they even tend to swirl a little bit. Uh, they are associated with calcifications. And as we had mentioned in class, this tumor doesn't actually invade the brain. It just kind of pushes into it. And often, you can see something like this. And this thick pink area right here is the dura. And you can see that this tumor is associated with the dura and extending from the dura in this case. So this is a case of a meningioma. Uh, and you can see a nice dural component here. Another common tumor, um, one that we don't see quite as much as the glioblastoma or the meningioma, uh, is this tumor. And so at low power you can see that this tumor is not near as cellular as the glioblastoma multiforme was. And even at low power you can make out these little clear halos. Uh, and those are indeed the fried egg cells as we like to call them. So you have this thick cytoplasm with this little centrally located round nucleus. And so, of course, this is an oligodendroglioma. Uh, oligodendrogliomas uh, are often said to have this fried egg-like morphology. Now, of course, these can be associated with the deletions in 1P and 19Q. And if that happens, of course, these people have a much better prognosis. Um, you know, grossly, we had mentioned that these tumors are also associated with calcifications and cyst formation and what you can see in these areas are small little microcysts forming. Now these cysts might be small, they might be microscopic as in this case, or they might be really large. Uh, this case has no calcifications but that doesn't mean that it's not an oligodendroglioma. Um, so you know when you think about calcifying tumors this would be one of them along with the meningioma that we saw previously. So a nice example of an oligo. And then finally, one last tumor, and this is one that has a nice characteristic finding 
that we can see uh, right here. And so when you look at this tumor, it is rather cellular. Um, this is in this area, the nuclei lining up uh, around these blood vessels, and that would be what we would call a perivascular pseudo rosette. Uh, another feature that you can see in this tumor, even at low power, is that the nuclei tend to line up uh, along these pink spaces. Uh, and Robbins describes this as a uh, rosette canal or a rosette within a canal. So this is a nuclear canal, meaning it's a line. Uh, typically rosettes are kind of rounded and cut on end. Uh, when we go down and take a closer look at this tumor, uh, we can see that the cells do indeed center themselves on a little blood vessel. So this is a nice perivascular rosette that we would see in an ependymoma. And so as you guys remember, ependymomas happen uh, in the ependymal line ventricular system. Now, you know, in the young patients, they're going to happen usually in the cerebellar area. And in older patients, they're going to happen mainly in the spinal cord. Um, so this is a great example of an ependymoma. Uh, in an older patient, so this one would be more than likely located in the spinal cord.